<clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, my book, which I, I seem to have lost already, um, it, it's about a phenomenon that's uh, very widespread and I believe um, profoundly damaging uh, both um, for our foreign policy and uh, for our, our affairs in Britain. And that's a phenomenon of liberal-minded people, left-minded people going along with, making excuses for, apologising for, sometimes openly supporting the movements and ideas of the far right. Now, as this is uh, a somewhat unusual argument, um, uh, 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 I mentioned this on the BBC last week, and I think it's the first time in five years anyone who relies on the BBC for news has ever come across it. I, um, I, I'll, I'll quickly take, take you through a couple of vignettes which happened at the uh, time my book came out about uh, six weeks ago. Um, just to sort of ease you in and perhaps we can get uh, some debate going a bit later. Um, the first came from Martin Amis, who um, had, he was a friend of Salman Rushdie's and so had to confront radical Islam long before a lot of us did, long before a lot of us have, uh, if you can use the present tense. Um, he's also been abroad, he's also been living in South America for a couple of years. And when you return from abroad, you often see your country with a foreigner's eye. You see things that um, um, perhaps those of us who, who, who are stuck in the thick of it don't notice. And the Independent asked him, the Independent said to him, uh, Martin, what shocked you most about Britain since you came back? And Amy said, well, the first thing was uh, seeing a lot of fat, white, middle-aged people waddling through London, carrying banners saying, we're all Hezbollah now. And, um, and Amy said, uh, said um, well, you know, enjoy being Hezbollah while you can, because uh, Hassan Nasrallah, leader of Hezbollah, had said of the West, we want nothing from you, we want to eliminate you. Then he described how he, you might just say, oh, well, that's just the far left, it's just Trotskyists going from far left to far right, these things happen. Um, but then Amos said he went on the thoroughly mainstream question time, which is what, by, I suppose, uh, the entire politically, politically literate population of this country, you know, if not every episode, at least most. And a woman in the audience stood up and made the following argument. She said that um, because the United States had uh, supplied the Mujahideen, Osama bin Laden, when they were fighting the Afghan communists and the Soviet Union, the correct response to the bombing of New York and of Washington was for the US Air Force to bomb itself, to bomb its own country. And Amy said with obvious astonishment, he said, uh, and the audience applauded. it. And he said, it takes some doing, you know, when you're confronted with a tidal wave around the world, a tidal wave of uh, religious fanaticism that is homophobic, misogynist, totalitarian and racist, and people in Britain are up the backsides of it. They're up the backsides of those who want them dead. I'm actually using a rather stronger word than backsides, but as, as this is a genteel literary festival, I'll have to leave that to your imagination. Now, about the same time Amos was speaking, Ken Livingston, uh, the mayor of my uh, hometown of London, was organising a, a conference with the ap uh, apocalyptic title of The Clash of Civilizations. Um, uh, I was invited to speak. I didn't go because... Uh, I've had it with that crowd of people, and I know the form. These meetings are assiduously rigged, the panel's rigged, uh, the audience is all from the same opinion, and there's always a stooge brought in from the outside whose job is to be abused and condemned fairly or not. But friends of mine did, uh, the political editor of the New Statesman, columnist on the Times, head of index and censorship, all conventionally left-wing people, good people who sort of believed in... Um, Livingston, and they were just stunned by it all. They were stunned by um, what was said, what was said about the 77 bombings, and you can find their comments all over the internet. But it actually took a, uh, a French feminist, Agnès Poirot, from the Republican, secular French trad tradition to spot what was wrong. And she said, hold on a second, hold on a second, there are no special facilities for Christians here, or for Jews, or for Hindus, but there are special prayer rooms for Muslims. And to make matters worse, there's a man's prayer room and a woman's prayer, prayer room. You know, I'm out of here, this is sexism, this is segregation. Is that what Ken Livingston believes in? Well, yes, it is, to an extent, for people with brown skins, not for people with white skins, for people with brown skins. Uh, he and many people in the left-wing press in London have allied themselves with the Muslim Brotherhood. Livingston constantly promotes Yusuf al-Qaradari, who believes in female circumcision. 
wife beating, as long as it's done gently, um, the killing of Israeli children uh, as legitimate target, uh, the killing of homosexuals, the killing of any Muslim man or woman who does what each and every one of us in this room is entitled to do and abandons the religion they were brought up in or, um, to make matters worse, decides there is no God and, um, and gives up on religion completely. Now, al Qaradari is interesting for this reason. There is a very brave, very beleaguered band of Arab liberals, Arab, Arab socialists, who just are having the most appalling time. On the one hand, they've got um, authoritarian states, which are out to get them. On the other hand, they've got radical listeners, which are out to kill them, more often not if they speak out of turn. Um, but they have 2,500 Arab intellectuals have banded together and petitioned the UN about preachers of hate, preachers who threaten their very lives, threaten their very lives for saying what you and I can say, uh, 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 threaten our freedoms, which we, I think we sometimes take too much for granted. And they've petitioned the UN about these preachers of hate, and top of their list is al Qaradari. So Livingston is making, and a lot of the left in London, are making a positive choice. Rather than support liberals, feminists, socialists, people in the Arab world who have every right to expect uh, the support of, uh, of Livingston, he is choosing the extreme theocratic right. Now, here's what makes this a little bit more than a local story. If you read the national press, listen to the BBC, listen to Channel 4 News, you will everywhere hear Ken Livingston described as the left-wing mayor of London. I, I, I imagine if I were to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to name the most senior left-wing um, politician in Britain, you, some of you might say Ken Livingstone. It is now seems to be the definition of being left-wing is to go along with movements and ideas of, of, of the far right, as long as they're anti-Western. You know, if, if we're talking about the BNP or native far right, far right parties, that's fine. That's fine. We can handle those. It's as long as they are anti-Western. <laughs> Now, conservative critics, some conservative critics, not all by any means, uh, have given my book uh, good reviews, and I'm not complaining. Um, you, frankly, you want the dubious pleasure of making a writer your friend for life. All you have to do is give him or her a good review and we'll follow you around forever like a, like a dog. Uh, but they, they, they do seem to rather uh, miss the point of what I'm trying to say. Uh, in the 20th century, it seems to me, I don't know the same thing seemed to Christopher, that those of us on the left, we had some kind of hierarchy. At the top was socialism, which was democratic or totalitarian, constantly argued about, like the kingdom of God, never came. The next stage down was what we've got, liberal democracy, mixed economy, a welfare state, uh, actually um, far more valuable than perhaps people like me and Christopher thought when we were younger. And at the very bottom is fascism, sectarianism, uh, ethnic hatred, religious hatred. It's one thing, it was one thing, for um, people on the left to go along with the Soviet Union or go on CND marches where we didn't really like to think very much about the Soviet Union. I understand how people do that. I understand how that happens because somehow or other we managed to convince themselves they were still left wing. It is quite another for people to go along with movements of the far right. That seems to me to be tearing up the basic achievements, the basic, the hard won knowledge of liberals and leftists from after. 1945. It also seems to me uh, to be fantastically morally disreputable because those Arab liberals and socialists and feminists who petition the United Nations, who uh, put their own lives at risk uh, to argue for democratic and enlightenment values, what happens to them? Well, what happens to them is one of the most common spectacles, most uh, under-recorded spectacles uh, in the modern world. You saw it with Kurdish socialists who ended up uh, talking to the Pentagon. You can see it just very recently about Ayan Hirsi Ali, uh, who is savaged by liberal intellectuals. In fact, and frankly, the only safe home she can find is with the American Enterprise Institute, a very free market and in conventional terms, very right-wing uh, think tank in, in, in Washington. Um, now, there's a, 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 a sort of meme uh, to use, as I'm in Oxford, I will better use Dawkins' words. There's a meme going round about my book that says, Oh, Nick, oh, Nick, oh, Nick's done. You know, if you tap your liberal intelligentsia in London, this great squawking comes up and this great effort to pretend that we're always okay, that we're always sane, we're always rational, we always are doing the decent thing. 
And they say, oh, well, yes, okay, Nick's just highlighted, uh, you know, people on the fringe, the leaders of the anti-war movement, leaders of respect. Um, well, first of all, if anyone's read my book, that's simply not true. There's vast amounts about what's happened to liberal mainstream. But the second thing is, this is very comforting, because if the far left, or the far right, or whatever you want to call it these days, if they are actively working for the enemies of people who want freedom and feminism in the Arab world, the liberal mainstream isn't so much, doesn't have the guts to actually come out against all of that, it just ignores them, blanks them out, refuses to treat them with equality of respect, refuses to give them a hearing, even if they are, um, even, if, even if they disagree with them. You know, just because someone calls themselves liberal, you d it doesn't mean they have your support. You automatically have your support, but you ought to at least treat them as, as an equal. Um, uh, if you doubt me, go back to that question time audience that Amos mentioned. Um, I, I know la Labour ministers have told me they remain astonished. You know, the thing that absolutely sent fear to their hearts was when Hilary Benn, a very decent minister, went on question time with Piers Morgan, who, again, this is a genteel literary festival, I don't know quite how to describe Piers Morgan. Um, the nicest way to put it is a Burke. And a, very, and a very satisfying book, a very, uh, um, you know, a Dickensian book, a simple book. You only have to hear him speak to know he's a book. And um, oh, look at him, you know, there's none of the complexity of modernism in the 20th century in him. And, um, and, uh, and um, Morgan goes on, Morgan goes on and, uh, and says, and is roaring with laughter about saying how democracy is failing in Iraq. And um, the audience applauds him. Um, Hillary Benn then stands up and says, look, he's met brave men and women in Iraq who are being massacred by forces which are against everything they pretend to hold true, and he's booed. Now, it's an attempt to explain that reaction. It's an attempt to explain how we've got to this state um, that, <laughs> that I've written my book. It's a history. And um, as I'm running out of time, if you want my explanations, you may have to wait for your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> Peter. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. It's nice to be woken up by bells in Oxford again uh, after so many years and to find that having never having slept in Christchurch before, that the rules are the same as they were when I was at Balliol, that the bed is almost as narrow as oneself, even though oneself has expanded a bit. <laughs> and the motto remains, we can't stop you doing it, but we can make it very uncomfortable. <laughs> Reassuring in a way. It may not be obvious to you, it might not be obvious to Nick, uh, how I can connect my own views about the um, weird combination of nihilism and masochism that has spread across what was once the British liberal left with um, the biography of Thomas Jefferson. But actually, I can do it, and, and I will. Trust me. I'm going to begin, though, just by saying why it is that anyone who's interested in America has to be interested in Mr. Jefferson under at least three or four headings, um, the Enlightenment, the concept of nation building, and uh, the concept of revolution, and the problem of slavery. And I'll deal with them all swiftly. You might not say that Philadelphia in the late 18th century was, was like fifth century Athens exactly, but you could certainly say that it was a magnet city for the Enlightenment in a, in a global sense of the word. Not only was it associated with very famous scientists and free thinkers and innovators of the, of the native uh, school, Benjamin Franklin obviously being the best, the man who uh, probably discovered, could be said to have discovered at least the uses of electricity, if not electricity itself, the applications of it, and a prodigious writer about natural philosophy, but also men like Joseph Priestley, uh, the discoverer of oxygen, who when his uh, laboratory in Birmingham was destroyed, smashed by a mob shouting for church and king, because of his defense of revolutionary ideas and because of his Unitarianism, took his broken instruments and his, the remains of his burned books and crossed the Atlantic and headed for Philadelphia, as did the greatest Englishman and the greatest American of them all, Thomas Paine, wafted across on the same tide of ideas and, and uh, innovation and free thinking with a letter in his pocket of introduction from Benjamin Franklin when he arrived. Mr. Jefferson was a very distinguished member of this group too. Um, he helped, for example, Dr. Jenner to refine the idea of inoculation against uh, smallpox um, at a time when America's leading divine, uh, Timothy Dwight, 
one of the founders of Yale University, said that inoculation was profane because it was an interference with God's design, which, given God's design of the idea of smallpox in the first place, presumably inoculation is an interference with that, with that design. Uh, Jefferson managed to find a way of conveying the vaccine uh, from state to state without it going uh, sour, as it were, without losing its potency, by keeping it chilled. Um, he helped to teach Lewis and Clark on their expedition crossing the United States, discovering its new boundaries, how to apply these inoculations when they met Indian people. So he taught them cartography, taught them astronomy and navigation in, in every, every sense, could have taught them if he'd wanted to, quite a bit about agriculture, viniculture, and the law of the sea. When there was a question of a treatise on whaling, Mr. Jefferson wrote an account of the problem himself, uh, just to establish what was known or not knowable about these things. It was a time when the frontiers of knowledge were considered to be almost contiguous with the frontiers of, of liberty. I suppose that's one definition of the Enlightenment, the belief that knowledge is power, and powerfully exemplified in the life of Philadelphia at that time. And this extraordinary coincidence of, of men and ideas at one moment leads to the seizing of an opportunity to declare independence from the hated Hanoverian crown and to establish for the first time and this is my second point in a way, the first ever and still the first and only republic in human history that explicitly separates the church and the state, that says in terms, in written documents, that, are, that remain a work in progress subject to revision and amendment and thus make this the great subject for any writer, the American Republic, that uh, the, the word God has no place in official discourse. The American Constitution does not mention the word God at any point deliberately excludes it, except when mentioning the necessity of separating religion from politics. And when God is mentioned platonically, so to speak, or maybe neo-platonically, in documents like the Declaration, he's evoked by those who consider themselves to be deists, in other words, those who do not believe that God intervenes in human affairs, of whom Jefferson, if he wasn't an atheist, which I think he probably was, certainly was, uh, a deist, a Unitarian, one who did not believe in divine intervention. So, a prize almost beyond all, all value or computation. At last, the world of European theocracy, the divine right of kings, the endless tyranny over the mind has been smashed and broken in a, in, a, in a country that has a fair chance of growing, of becoming a nation, of ceasing to be what it was at the time of the revolution, roughly that's to say the equivalent to North America of what Chile now is to South America, that's to say a long ribbon of territory between the mountains and the sea on the coast and to become a continental republic. It becomes that principally because, again I'm condensing, of the bravery of the Haitian Revolution. The ideas of the French Revolution uh, inspire a slave rebellion in Haiti led by the first real slave general of genius since Spartacus, Toussaint Louverture, who takes the ideas of uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité and turns them on the French Empire, destroys the French army, destroys a French fleet, uh, raises the standard of the first uh, black republic in the hemisphere, and forces Bonaparte to sell not just the town of New Orleans, but the whole of Louisiana and beyond, doubling the size of the United States in one day to Thomas Jefferson, oddly enough on the 4th of July, 1801. So that when the Lewis and Clark expedition sets out to prospect the interior and look for a frontier in California, they're able to tell the Indian peoples with whom they meet that they already live in the United States and that the reign of British and French and Spanish crowns in North America is over forever. An extraordinary lifetime, and I've only uh, dwelt on a little bit of it, but shadowed uh, all of it, every bit of it, every single bit of it, by the taint of slavery, which, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, is very much in our atmosphere this year with the anniversary of Mr. Wilberforce's triumph. Even, it's even present, actually, in the idea of the Enlightenment and the struggle to apply knowledge and technique to liberation, because it turns out that not all devices are liberating. Not all technology is labor-saving, after all. Um, the cotton gin, Mr. Whitney's great invention, it turns out prolongs slavery, makes it more profitable for many more years. Uh, so even the ideas of new machinery uh, can be made into weapons of alienation against people whose labor is extracted from them by force, people who are owned as property. So even in the Enlightenment vision, there's a negation. It has to be said that the same is true of the expansion of the country. When Thomas Jefferson bought 
Louisiana and doubled the size of the country. Thomas Paine came to him and Joel Barlow came to him and many other of his old Philadelphia comrades came to him and said, we can start again, we can start anew, we can start without the original sin of the country. We can start without the stain of slavery, which in the Constitution had defined an African as worth three-fifths of a human being for voting purposes. We can begin again without slavery, again because of the influence this time of the um, sugar interest Jefferson needed or felt he needed to continue the institution of slavery and to expand it into the new territories. Uh, and so it shadows even this moment of the liberation of the rest of the continent and actually bodies forth the likelihood of a civil war because the new states cloned from Louisiana are going to equalize with the number of free states in time. And once the union is half slave and half free, there can only be one issue which, alas, Mr. Jefferson passes on to his descendants and to Mr. Lincoln to solve. Mr. Lincoln being born, by the way, Abraham Lincoln, on the very same day of the very same month of the very same year as Charles Darwin. Um, Mr. Darwin is just out of sight of Mr. Jefferson when he prospects in uh, Virginia and uh, looks at the topography and wonders how it is the shells are quite as high as they are on the mountaintop can't yet quite work out why it is. He can go no further than deism in his rejection of divine intervention, just on the cusp of, of the enlightenment that will show to humans that ethics and politics and life is possible without God altogether. And it also shadows his foreign policy, because in fact he would have put down that Haitian rebellion, the very one that liberated not just Haiti, but of the southern states of America, if he could, because he was so afraid that the example of Haiti would spread to Virginia and Georgia and the Carolinas. But, and here I'm going to try and meld and mesh myself with Comrade Cohen, but uh, Je Mr. Jefferson is prepared to do one thing, and it's the following. In North Africa, what were vulgarly called the Barbary states at the time, that's to say the North African member states of the Ottoman Empire, today's Algeria, Libya, Tunisia and Morocco, um, we estimate, Linda Colley's book, uh, Captives, is one of the best resources for you to read here if you wish, between, say, about 1650 and about 1830, uh, approximately a million and three quarters European and Americans were captured, kidnapped on the high seas by the navies of the Ottoman Empire and taken into slavery. Um, it extended quite a long way. It wasn't just guarding the Straits of Gibraltar and the Pillars of Hercules, the approaches to the Atlantic and taking ships and their crews, though that was done very often and their passengers. But raids as far north as the town of Baltimore in Ireland, the whole of whose population was carried off in one night into slavery by Muslim slavers in the late 17th century, and uh, many towns in Devon and Cornwall. As far north as Iceland, this trade, shameful trade went on. And it started to attack the United States as well as soon as it became independent. And Mr. Jefferson went to um, see the ambassador of Barbary in London, he himself at the time being ambassador in Paris. He went with John Adams. He said, by what right do you do this to Americans, uh, American ships, people, civilians? How, by what right do you take them and, and imprison them and enslave them? The United States has no quarrel with you. We've signed a treaty with Tripoli saying we're not a Christian country. Uh, we took no part in the Crusades. We took no part in the, Recon the Reconquista, the Reconquest of Andalusia. We are, we've never been and are not your enemy. And the Ambassador Abdurrahman replied to him in London, in Grosvenor Square, said, our Quran gives us the right to do it. The Quran gives us the right to make slaves of any infidel who doesn't recognize the rule of our prophet and the rule of our empire. And, and to demand tribute from them if we are so generous as to withhold this uh, policy, is to refrain from it. And at this point, Mr. Jefferson decided that that means war. The existence of this policy is incompatible with the existence of the United States. A navy will be built, a marine corps will be founded, we will send a fleet, we will put down this trade. And we will not just put down the slave trade, but we will force a passage through Gibraltar, allowing free trade for every other country between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. That is the birth of America as a superpower. The very thing that every liberal considers to be the most degraded kind of imperialism now, the very, um, the very uh, triumph, in other words, of, of enlightenment ideas and free trade ideas in combination uh, that gives rise to the idea of Jeffersonian, as we call it, democracy. Not very many people have their names coterminous with democracy, have a democracy named for them. Mr. Jefferson is one. We should all be so 
lucky. So I just wanted to make this point among others and to say that my investigations into this argument and also to my, my companion book on this, um, on the American founding, on the original ideas of 1776 and uh, the American Revolution, suggest very powerfully and very strongly to me that the American Revolution is the only revolution left standing. To round off what Nick has said about the um, ultimate discredit or exhaustion or implosion or negation of the Chinese Revolution of 1948, the Soviet Revolution of 1917, the Cuban Revolution now in its final parodic stages of decay, uh, the, the, the investments in, in illusory utopia in which so many of the left have put their trust in the past and the way in which men like George Galloway now looking still for a fatherland of totalitarianism that they can adopt now say openly what I suspected them of thinking they now say openly well the proletariat may have died out on us but we still have Islam as the revolutionary force the force that opposes the bourgeoisie opposes uh, imperialism and capitalism get ready for this to be the prevailing illusion well it will be combated by the only democratic and humanist revolution that still has validity that still could be a model for other countries in the separation of church and state, a written constitution, a separation of powers, and a, and a free market. There are not many countries I can think of that don't have those things that would not be better off with them, including our own, still ludicrously run by a, by a monarchy that is the head of the church as well as the head of the state and the armed forces. Could anything be more ludicrous than that? And who's slobbering chinless Dauphin has told us that he wishes to be the head of the Muslim uh, worshippers in this country as well as the deluded Anglicans who follow his reign. Uh, that's what it's like to come back to England for me to find all that still going on and getting worse. Well, uh, need I say more? Um, you've, you've been warned. You've seen uh, what anti-Americanism leads to. It leads to the worship of what I wouldn't hesitate to call fascism leads to a masochistic attitude to our own democracy and our own civilization. It leads to an, an overprivileging of the most, the most dismal, uh, reactionary, and, and backward ideas of all, the ideas of religion. Thank you. <laughs>